The talk today will be in essentially three parts. The first is just generic assessment of energy sources and how you might go about that. We'll discuss where our energy comes from today, which you may already have some idea about. We'll have a quick rundown of some of the proposed alternate, alternate energy sources that you may have heard of, and also take a look at some of the barriers that any new energy source might encounter as we might or might not try to implement it. Solar energy from space, if you haven't heard of it before, I'm going to describe what it is, how it works, what the barriers to its adoption might be, how it compares with other energy sources. Also, during the course of the talk, if you have any questions, please just stick your hand up there and uh, I encourage uh, us to be uh, interactive in, in this discussion. Finally, we'll conclude and we'll say, come up with an assessment as to whether solar energy from space is a source of energy that deserves uh, further investigation. So, where does our energy come from today? It's probably no surprise that uh, most of our energy comes from non-renewable sources, fossil fuels. If you look at the top row here, the, uh, the four there make up the vast majority of the energy we consume. This plot shows you from 1971 through 2011 what the production of various energy sources has been. This comes from the International Energy Agency, a report they do annually. This one is from last year. If you want to look at this in a slightly different way, you can see it broken out from the whole, and about 85% of the energy is non-renewable. You can see natural gas, coal, and oil represent a, a huge portion. Nuclear, even though it's been around for many decades, still about 5%, and this is for the entire world. Uh, biofuels and waste is about 10%, and then uh, the others are, are almost negligible. And I'll, and I'll go uh, in a moment into a, a broader breakdown of that tiny portion. A couple considerations. So as we mentioned, about 85% of our current energy supply is drawn from exhaustible sources. Whether you think they're going to run out in 10 years or 100 years or 200 years, the fact is there's a finite supply. It is going to run out. One way to represent this is what's been called the matchstick plot. And this image comes from another blog that you owe it to yourself to check out, the Do the Math blog, which is uh, written by Tom Murphy, a professor at the University of California, San Diego. And he points out that uh, it's only been the last few hundred years, and, and he's not the only one to observe this. This, this <coughs> graphic is his, but the idea has been around for some time. Uh, prior to the usage and leveraging of fossil fuels, pretty much people burned wood, and they used muscle power to get things done, to plow the fields. and build the pyramids and what have you. We have what you might think of as a single matchstick in the form of all these <coughs> fossil fuels that we're using now. Once they're gone, they're not going to come back for a long time because it took many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years for them to form, and they are certainly not going to be uh, regenerated as quickly as we consume them. So we have to come up with something once they're out, lest we uh, are in a situation where we, we certainly would have to change our lifestyles, consume a lot less energy. Um, and there's actually a whole parallel discussion. One thing that we've enjoyed in the last hundred, couple hundred years is this linear increase in the consumption of energy, and it has created a mentality that growth doesn't really have a limit. It can just kind of continue linearly forever. And of course, that's not true either, because once again, we're starting from finite resources. Kind of a whole different discussion, but certainly something worth uh, Realizing. And then, if you have read Phil's blog, and I think he even posted something about this just in the last uh, week or so, uh, climate change is a concern for a lot of us. Despite uh, some uh, columnist writings uh, recently calling this into question whether it's settled science or not, consensus is that uh, climate change is real, that it does have uh, anthropogenic uh, origins, and we, it would behoove us to do something about it. All right, so let's break down that tiny little sliver of the renewable and clean energy a little bit more. So uh, this is about 15% of the total, and this is a little bit different. This is the consumption rather than the production side, but for our discussion, they're essentially equivalent. Uh, the huge brown wedge you see, the biomass and heat, the majority of that is people using their wood-burning stoves for heat and cooking. So 
That is, that is not high tech. You can see that the proportions of everything else is diminishingly small. You've probably heard a lot and seen a lot about photovoltaics, perhaps even on your way here today, maybe even at your house, you have photovoltaics, but you can see they re represent a very minuscule amount of our existing energy sources today. So it's a little sobering to look at this when you think of what portion of energy we consume is use it once and then it's gone. I guess another interesting thing to think about is these conventional sources, the oil, natural gas, and coal, are really solar energy that's just been stored for us over time. So the, uh, the sun, of course, is the, the closest thing in our solar system we have to an uh, infinite source of energy. And it's not actually infinite. So what are some other possible future energy sources? People have been doing research in artificial photosynthesis for quite some time with kind of uh, varying results. Breeder reactors are a form of nuclear energy that help dispense with uh, proliferation issues and radioactive waste storage issues. They're certainly being investigated. They do use fuel, which is also finite. Fusion energy, we've been doing fusion research for coming up on uh, over 60 years, I think. Uh, methane hydrates are found on the sea floor. They're another carbon-based source of energy. Also, also finite, also would contribute to uh, greenhouse gases and climate change. Solar energy from space, which also has gone by the name space solar power, solar power satellites, power sat, space space solar power. It has a lot of different names, but the concept is the same. And then there's, there's others that I'm not mentioning here, but these are some of the major classes. So we might ask, ask well, how do we compare these? And I'm going to go back to my friend Tom Murphy's blog. He uh, posts on, his blog is largely about energy issues, and he has come up with his own subjective rating scale and created this alternative energy matrix to take a stab at comparing these. And one thing you probably know if you've read his blog or you should know in looking at this is he has uh, a penchant towards solar energy, which is perhaps one of the reasons that it comes out on top, although he fully discloses that and he, he recognizes that. The way he created this matrix is he took 10 criteria, abundance, difficulty, intermittency, demonstrated electricity, heat, transport, acceptance, backyard, and efficiency, and applied a subjective rating, one of three subjective ratings, or in the case of deuterium, deuterium fusion, one of four subjective ratings, to try to come up with a quantitative assessment. So if it gets a green box, that's a positive score, and you get plus one point. If it's a yellow box, it's kind of the middle, and you get zero points. If you get a red box, it's minus one. And sum up all the boxes, and you come up with this uh, relative score. So one thing that you may find interesting is a conventional fission, which even though it only amounts to 5% of the world's energy, he is scoring only at a two versus the solar ones, which score much higher. So again, a lot of limitations here. This is subjective, but it helps you think a little bit about what are the considerations that we want to have in mind when we're examining these alternative energy sources. Now, you say, well, oh, question? Sorry, could you read the top line, the, the different criteria one more time? Certainly. Abundance, which just means if you use the, how much can you use before you run out? So if you look at the like tidal energy, there's only a couple places you could implement that. So that's not especially abundant if you're in the Rocky Mountains. It's not going to be your best source of, of energy. Uh, uh, similarly, for like geothermal, if you're not near a geothermal vent, uh, the difficulty is how much effort you have to put into actually getting the energy. Intermittency, which is actually a pretty important consideration because currently there is no means of grid scale energy storage. And this is a huge issue because with the increase in the alternative, the wind and solar, if the sun's not shining, you don't, if it's nighttime, you don't have solar. If it's not windy, you don't have wind. And if you don't have a good way to store the energy, that means you're back to your 85% your fossil fuels. So, uh, so the intermittency is a pretty, pretty important uh, factor. Demonstrated, it's pretty self-explanatory. Electricity, whether it's a, a source that is suitable for generating electricity, heat, whether you would use it for heating, transport, whether it could be used in a liquid fuel for transportation, acceptance, whether the public would say, oh, I don't know if I'm really into having that next to my, my house. Backyard, if you could do it on a small scale, so you can put solar panels on your house, you're not going to put a fission reactor in your house, hopefully. And then the efficiency, which 
actually turns, in, in my mind, to something that, while interesting, doesn't really tell that much of the story. So you'll notice, and actually I think I've discussed this in a uh, chart or two, that he doesn't really have anything that directly relates to an economic consideration here. And later I'm going to show you some information from the, the U.S. Energy Information Agency that does have that to, to apply kind of that consideration. So the top one, you probably saw he has a solar photovoltaics. PV is just photovoltaics. So that's your solar panel you're probably familiar with. He has that on a, a scale of a five. If you look at the conventional sources, oil, natural gas, and coal, they, of course, do very well, which is one of the reasons they comprise 85% of our current energy consumption. So what I did, and, and this, is, this is my assessment, not Tom Murphy's. I said, all right, so if I use his criteria and his same scale and I apply that to solar power satellites, solar energy from space, what would the score be? And I think it's probably also a one or a two. It's probably in the same neighborhood as your fusion and uh, your kind of non-demonstrated, more uh, futuristic uh, energy sources. And obviously, in space, you can have all the sunlight you want. Uh, the difficulty of it would be the accessing to space. I'm going to go into more depth on this later. One of the biggest selling points is, unlike ground solar, it's not intermittent. There has been some research and development on it. It's great for electricity. The heat and transport you could do if you use the electricity. The acceptance, the, whenever I talk about solar power satellites, the first thing people invariably ask is, well, isn't it going to fry birds? And it turns out uh, there's, there's a couple answers to that question, but <laughs> really probably not. And then you would have to do it on a scale where it's not suitable for doing it in your backyard, and the efficiency is comparable to, to ground solar. Other factors that Tom or anybody else might use in comparing alternative sources of energy is weighting these factors differently. So in the matrix I showed you, all of the considerations are weighted the same, not necessarily appropriate. Dispatchability is the ability to get that energy to a place that you want when you want it. Usually you have a power plant that's sitting there and if you need the power, you better be hooked up to the grid that the power plant's hooked up to or somewhere where you can use it. It's uh, hard, you, you wouldn't take your nuclear plant and move it from Iowa to Maine for some reason probably. For the futuristic ones, when you develop them, much like the space program of the 1960s, we got a lot of technological dividends where while we were trying to solve the challenging problem of going to the moon, we developed a lot of technology that then found a home elsewhere and improved our lives in other ways that we might not have expected. So certainly uh, some of these are better suited to that sort of dividend than others. And then a huge one is the economic attractiveness. And there's many, many factors under this. I'm just going to hit the two of the big ones. The, the payback period, how long does it take for you to make back all the money that you spent to develop the system? The operating expenses, do you have to buy fuel for it every day? Or in the case of the solar panel, are you just getting the sunlight for free? Return on investment. So there's, there's a lot of factors in there that uh, is probably also a presentation unto itself. So let's talk about, question? Yeah, I, I can't recall if you had this, but it seems to me that the issue of infrastructure requirement might be another major factor. Yeah, definitely true. I suppose that could fall under difficulty, but certainly that that is its own consideration. Like, do you need to have, and, and I guess maybe a little bit of the backyard too, because like with the, the solar panels you can buy at Home Depot and stick in your backyard, no infrastructure requirement, the fission reactor fission reactor, you obviously need the grid to get it to your house. So, so that is a big consideration. That also ties into the expense as well. So yeah, cer certainly worth something to consider. So for any new energy source, I've boiled it down to three potential barriers. And this is by no means uh, all comprehensive. But I think it's a good place to start, particularly in examining these things from a skeptical point of view. So the first one is physical. Is the proposed energy source consistent with the laws of physics? If it's not, you should be very skeptical. Technology. Does the technology to actually implement this source of energy exist, or are you looking at a huge campaign to develop new technology? And then finally, back on the economics. If it's wonderful, but it's going to be extraordinarily expensive, there has to be someone who's willing to pay for it. It's probably not, not ever going to get off the ground. 
let's go into a little bit more depth on each of these three barriers. So you're probably familiar with the laws of thermodynamics. First law of thermodynamics uh, involves the principle of conservation of energy. You, you cannot uh, create or destroy the energy. This has often been succinctly summed up as you can't win. You're not going to get more out than you put in. Second law of thermodynamics puts succinctly, you can't break even. If you do any kind of conversion, you're going to lose energy. You can't have any, any conversion that is 100% efficient. So good, good way to think of it. You can't win. You can't break even. A couple sources that fail the physics test. You may be familiar with some of these. Uh, any perpetual motion machines or over unity devices. We, you know, and, and of course, if you have a working prototype, it's a different story, but nobody has a working prototype. So and these guys have been around for a long time, and they have various injunctions around uh, and uh, judgments from uh, the uh, government, organ govern government organizations against them, but they, they persist, uh, and they, are, they don't own any power companies. Cold fusion, some of you may remember uh, 1989, the Utah State uh, cold fusion flap, and there is still a community, and now it's called uh, Low Energy Nuclear Reactions, and it, it persists. It's another case where whenever I find one of these folks and I talk to them, I say, all right, so when are we going to hear about the revenge of cold fusion? And we have yet to see it, so it's always a, a month or a year away. And then there's zero-point energy, which is a real quantum mechanical phenomenon, but the ability for us to get usable energy out of it is uh, dubious at best. So some sources that fail the physics test. Does the technology exist? As you might imagine, there are a lot of organizations whose very livelihoods and existence depend on technology, and they've come up with a rating scale for this. So the simplest question is, has anything been done previously? Now, I know Scott knows working with uh, NASA, there is something called the technology readiness level, a bane of, ex of the existence of many engineers. And there's a lot of different versions of it, but they're all essentially trying to convey the same thing, which is how ready is the technology for prime time? Like how much, and it's really how much is it going to cost? If, if I'm going to spend a million bucks, but the TRL is only th three, I shouldn't expect to have a satellite in space at the end of the project. So taking it from the bottom, the level one would be this basic technology research. The, it doesn't break the laws of physics, but there's been no technology development whatsoever. Next level, next series of levels up would be proving that it's feasible, developing that technology, doing some sort of demonstration with it, <coughs> then developing the systems and subsystems that would go into that operational system. And in the case of a, a space context, you're launching it and operating in space. So DOD uses this, a lot of organizations use this. If you can assign a technology readiness level to something, you have a better idea of how far along it is. And of course, this is also something that's very subjective and people argue about a lot. Of. Where does scalability come? Something might work on a small scale, simply not scale properly. Where would that be evaluated? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And that is something where some things will not work at all on a small scale, but they'll work great on a large scale, or vice versa. So that's, a, that's an excellent point. I didn't mention that here, but certainly, uh, and that actually uh, is a factor for solar power satellites as well. Economically feasible. Is it competitive with existing energy prices? Pretty key question. Or if it is not competitive with existing energy prices, does it offer some sort of compelling advantage? And we're going to talk a little bit about what that compelling advantage might be. So let's start. Probably most of you paid an electric bill in the last month. Does anybody know how much you're paying in cents per kilowatt hour? Anybody? You just pay it online, you don't even look at it. <laughs> Ten cents, ten cents ish. Any any other? That's pretty good. It be the digits for the so it's I guess so. Probably some of you have Pepco and some of you have <laughs> Dominion. So I know I'm I'm paying about ten cents a kilowatt hour. Maybe it's like nine and a half or something like that. But yeah, but ten cents a kilowatt hour, pretty pretty close for a uh, for an estimate. So the uh, this these figures except for the the bottom row here are all, again from the International Energy. International Energy Agency. Uh, the average for U.S. residential, the cost, this is not the cost to generate, but the cost that you pay, is about 12 cents a kilowatt hour, so, so in that range. If you're in industry and you're buying hundreds of thousands of kilowatt hours a month, you get a, a break. Average there is six and a half, or 
You probably know that in the United States we pay a lot less for energy than other countries all around the world. I've just taken a couple uh, different examples. Denmark, they pay close to 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Japan, a country that has very limited natural resources, pays close to 30 cents an hour. And then there's a special case that you may not have thought that much about, and that is a remote U.S. military out outpost. Fortunately, at this point, we're uh, almost done with our, our various wars, but while in Afghanistan, I would speak to some of my friends who were deployed, and in order to get energy to them, sometimes it's not just the fuel convoy that you have to avoid the roadside bombs and the insurgent attacks, but it goes to the main forward operating base, and then to get to the combat outpost, maybe it takes a helicopter trip or a chain of helicopter trips, and by the time you get that fuel to where it's actually going to be used in the generator to power the communications equipment, you've spent a tremendous amount of money, not to mention the lives that you've risked and the equipment that you've risked. And there have, unsurprisingly, been a lot of government and DOD reports on this, and their report is that they're spending close to, in some cases, $10 a kilowatt hour, which sounds insane to us, but that's just what it costs because it's very difficult to get energy to some places. And there are other countries, like you could imagine, like a remote island would also be a very difficult place to get energy to. So, so there are some cases where people are paying a tremendous amount of energy, much more than we would pay on our Pepco or our Dominion and Virginia bill. Okay, so probably in the last week, oh, question? Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> you, you had the residentials for, the, uh, for other countries. Do you know what the industrial? Uh, it's in the same table. I didn't put them here. Uh, in general, the industrial is cheaper. There are a few countries where industrial is actually more expensive. And I guess that's based on kind of the tax structure. But, uh, but in general, the industrial tends to be about 60 to 70 percent of the residential. Okay. Uh, and the reason I ask is mostly because generally a lot of our energy policy is, you know, corporate driven. And, you know, they're looking very closely at, you know, their re rate relative to other, you know, industri industrial competitors. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I know in, in Mexico, uh, and their power is actually a little bit cheaper than ours in the residential side. I think it's like nine cents a kilowatt hour uh, national average. And their, uh, their industries pay a little bit more than that. They pay, I think I want to say they pay like 12. So, but, uh, but yeah, it's very easy to find this resource online. Um, and it's got a whole table for uh, many countries in the world. Not all of them, but certainly uh, a lot of them. All right, so probably in the last week, some of you have filled up your car with gas. Do you remember how much you paid per gallon? About 330. 330? 330? Yeah, 330. Okay. 353.9. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking uh, you're, you're probably getting regular. Uh, the same resource lists the prices for unleaded premium. And these, these figures are from 2013, so we know there's some fluctuations, some seasonal fluctuations. So in the U.S., if you're getting the uh, unleaded premium, their average was reported uh, just under 380. Uh, you like electricity elsewhere in the world. People pay a lot more for energy. In Turkey, it's uh, $10 a gallon. Netherlands, $9 a gallon. Japan, over $6 a gallon. And again, this remote military outpost, and they're usually using JPA, which is a, and it's similar to gasoline. It has about 10% higher energy content per gallon. Uh, but the electricity they're getting is from burning JPA. So the the cost. <laughs> Of, uh, of moving that fuel uh, can be enormous. So certainly if you went up to uh, Exxon and your tank said $400 a gallon, you'd probably go somewhere else. But, but they don't have a lot of options out there. Okay, so we've talked about assessment of kind of generic energy sources. I'm on now going to discuss with you space solar power. Does anybody know what space solar power is or think they know what it is? One, two, three, four. Okay, so most people, five. So most people have not heard of it or don't know what it is. Uh, you want to tell me what it is? Launch satellites with uh, photovoltaics and beam down microwaves and catch them in giant rectenna farms and see if you can get them to tell you how many sol equivalents, what the energy level will be. Excellent, succinct explanation. I think it's actually very similar to what the young man uh, early, earlier stated. So yeah, so essentially, uh, <laughs> so if you're copying him, you don't get credit. Uh, collection of uh, solar energy in space and its wireless transmission for use on Earth. All right, let's talk a little bit about the history. This idea, to my knowledge, first appears in an Isaac Asimov story from 1941 called Reason about some robots that are controlling this solar, uh, solar power station in orbit. Uh, 
and it develops a consciousness of its own, and it's actually a really interesting story. It's a short story, so it's, it's a quick read, but uh, you'll enjoy it. The concept is outlined by Peter Glazer, widely considered to be the, the father of this idea in Science Magazine in 1968. There was a demonstration that NASA did in 1975 where they actually had a big microwave beam over about a mile and they collected it with about 80% uh, efficiency. During the energy crisis of the 1970s, the Department of Energy and NASA spent about 20 million that and it's about 50 million uh, in inflation adjusted dollars studying this concept. The context of that time was very interesting because we had just been to the moon and a lot of engineers figured they could do anything they wanted and we had this energy crisis where there was suddenly this panic about like, wow, there is a threat to our way of living, the way we run our energy. We really need to figure out how we can get from under the thumb of these uh, OPEC countries. So there was a lot of, uh, lot of effort put into this and, and studies. Uh, North American company, the Boeing company, Raytheon, all did very extensive studies. Certainly to date, the most in-depth, detailed, uh, rigorous studies that have been done on solar power satellites. Energy crisis ended, people said, oh, well, I'm just going to stick with oil, we don't need to worry about anything else. So since that time, NASA and other organizations around the world, the International Academy of Astronautics, the Union of Radio Scientists International, various organizations have put together studies, the DOD has put together studies, there was a famous one in 2008 where they did a, a study that looked at this, and in general the conclusion of these studies has been that this is something uh, you can do, but that it would be fairly expensive. What's happening now with solar power satellites? There are actually about half a dozen companies that are pursuing the development of solar power satellites with kind of varying degrees of credibility. Uh, there's a company, uh, Solarin, in California that actually has a contract with Pacific Gas and Electric to supply energy from solar power satellites before uh, 2020. Japan and China currently spend on the order of $20 million a year doing research related to solar power satellites. The U.S. government does not currently have any research programs and people often say, well, part of this is because energy falls under the Department of Energy, but space doesn't. They don't do anything in space. And NASA's mission is really exploration, so why would they do anything related to energy? So how would it work? Well, you've heard the explanation. Let's use this graphic to kind of get a, a better sense of exactly how it might work. And, and before I explain this, you should be aware, and I'm going to show you a lot of different concepts in a minute, that there have been dozens and dozens of different ideas about how this could be done. And this is just kind of one example that, that shows you. So, so you got the, the, the sun here. If it's daytime, you don't need to bother with any satellites. You just stick your solar panel outside and you're, you're good to go. Uh, this particular configuration has big concentrating reflectors that direct, redirect the light onto the photovoltaics. It's converted from direct current, the output of the photovoltaics, to a microwave signal, comes out of a large antenna, and this, this satellite would most likely be in geosynchronous orbit so that it would appear to be over the same spot uh, on the Earth constantly. Beam is sent down to a large receiving station with the uh, rectennas, and those convert it back into the electricity that you would put into the grid. So functionally, the concept is fairly straightforward. I'll just, I have a number of different designs and, and it's generated tons of space art. So you can see many different variants on the one that I showed you on the previous chart. Some people have proposed using lasers instead of microwaves, just using reflectors. And you can see over, over the past several decades, there have been many, many different concepts. So what does the satellite actually have to do? I mean, basically it just has to do two things. It has to collect the energy, and it has to get that energy to the ground. So the collection could be done with a photovoltaics. That's what's usually posited. You could use some kind of big heat engine, a solar thermal sort of approach. Some people say this makes more sense because photovoltaics are bounded by the Shockley-Kisser limit, which says that you can never have 100% photovoltaic. Uh, the solar thermal, the heat engine, isn't bound by that limit, so theoretically it could be more efficient. You could actually have a laser and use the sunlight to, as a pump on the lasing material and generate laser, laser beam that way. To get the energy down, you could use the microwave approach like we've been discussing, or you could use a laser. Uh, 
The downside of the laser, well, there are a couple downsides of the laser, but one downside is the laser is not going to go through clouds as well as the microwave was, is going to. The, the microwaves, whether you have the worst monsoon ever, if you're below two and a half gigahertz, that energy beam is getting through 24 hours a day all, all the time. You could also just put a big reflector up in space, right, and just use that as a mirror. Who knows what that might do to the, uh, the wildlife, get a little confused about what time of day it is. Uh, but that's been proposed as well, and there's an, and a, a number of different scales as well. For the rest of our discussion today, I'm going to focus on the photovoltaic and microwave combination just because that's the one that has gotten the most attention and it makes it a, a little less complicated to discuss the, uh, the alternatives. So what are the advantages of doing this? Why, why would you want to go through the difficulty and expense of doing this rather than just, just having your solar panel on the ground? And I guess one way to start with that is to say, well, the advantages certainly in enjoyed are the same as with ground solar. You, you don't have the greenhouse gases other than during the manufacturing and production, which you have for pretty much all, any kind of uh, alternative. It doesn't require fuel. That's pretty huge. And this is really more a dig at uh, nuclear energy, but doesn't produce any radioactive waste. So, so that's a, certainly a benefit. One of the compelling benefits is it's never cloudy in space. It's never nighttime in space if you're in geosynchronous orbit, or more accurately, uh, 97 plus percent of the year, it is not nighttime. There's a brief period around the equinoxes when the satellite would be eclipsed uh, at local midnight for something like 40 minutes. So you could plan around that much like you have uh, any, any power plant is taken down periodically for maintenance. Uh, but it's effectively 24-7 all year round. There's a lot more solar light in space because it's not being attenuated through the atmosphere when you're on the ground. So more energy all the time. It becomes what's called a baseload power source. So if you have a coal plant or a nuclear plant, that thing is just going to keep running as long as you keep putting fuel in it. It's, uh, it's essentially all, always there. And the industry really likes this kind of plant because it provides baseload energy. You can count on it to be there. It's not like your wind and solar where it's like, oh, sorry, it's been cloudy for a week, or we're in the doldrums, no wind. So, so that you can use this as a baseload source, and it is also having the benefits of a lot of the renewable sources is kind of novel. If you have this satellite in space, you could either beam it to a single receiving station or you could beam it to receiving stations that would be on a pretty large portion of the Earth. One satellite could conceivably reach Seattle and places in South America just because you could redirect the beam. This gives you a big advantage where if the grid in one place just happened, your, your plant went down, or it's not windy, or it's not sunny. Oh, you just move the beam over there, you put the energy in there, and once that's resolved, you can send it back to wherever it usually would be. And, uh, it, it gives you an opportunity to fill in where energy is needed the most. If we actually went through the trouble to develop this, you would need to put a lot of mass in space, and in doing that, you would probably have to have launches something on the order of almost every day, depending on how the uh, approach was taken. If you were launching every day, instead of maybe once a month, or I guess around the world we have launches with some frequency, but, but the demand for launches comparatively is, is pretty low. But if there was a known that you're gonna have a launch every day, or maybe even more frequently, suddenly you have the opportunity to apply economies of scale to the launch industry. And the cost of launch potentially could be reduced dramatically. If you launch the cost, reduce the launch costs dramatically, maybe you also enable new industries like cheaper space tourism or extraterrestrial resource exploitation. So... Do you mean a launch per day while the infrastructure, while this is being built, or a launch per day forever? That sounds like rather a lot. Yeah, so you would have to put a lot of mass in space. Actually, it's a good segue into my next slide here. In almost every concept, you have to put a pretty large amount of mass in space, and that's going to require a lot of launches. Once you've assembled the satellite, you don't have to do launches anymore other than what you might have to do for maintenance, although some people say, oh, you know, you get your robots up there, and you can just have them fix stuff, and you use stuff from the moon, so you don't have to bring anything else from the Earth. And some, some people say you should start building this from extraterrestrial materials and not launch all this stuff from Earth, get your asteroids or your lunar material and build it that way. And certainly 
I mean, again, that's not against the laws of physics, but we haven't built anything yet <laughs> from extraterrestrial materials, really. So that kind of makes, makes it even more into the realm of science fiction, which not to say impossible, but certainly farther, farther down the road. So yeah, so this, this is a big issue, having to put all this mass in space, all, all these launches you'd have to do. The power transmission. We've talked about the microwave beam, radio wave beam. People associate microwaves with the box in their kitchen that cooks their chicken. So their first thought may be, is this going to cook the bir birds that are flying by? Is this going to interfere with my Bluetooth, with my Wi-Fi? Is it going to, with this beam flying down, or what if an airplane flies through it or a satellite goes through it? And these are good questions. It turns out that the way you design the system gives you some latitude. You can either have a large collection area with a low power density <laughs> beam, kind of makes sense, or you can have a small collection area with a high power intensity beam. And this is something really that the engineering requirements would dictate. Like if you're in the military base case, you probably don't have acres and acres where you can put this huge collection thing. So you would need to have something small that's a, a uh, high intensity. But it's a trade-off. And you could, you could kind of push it either way. We're already in a situation where if you look at nuclear power plants, they have good perimeter security. You can't fly a commercial airline over a nuclear power plant. You probably wouldn't fly a commercial airliner over one of these rectenna farms where you're collecting all the energy from space. So and then the costs. Definitely, this has been a common theme in a lot of the studies. And can't, you can't really deny that this is, this is something that would be expensive. Doing almost anything in space is expensive. So how does it fare against our three barriers that we outlined earlier? Question? In terms of funds, I guess, first I have to ask a question. How many of these ISOs do you require to cover the United States, for example? So it depends what you're asking. The, the coverage of a single satellite would be large, but it would not be able to provide power unless it was uh, staggeringly enormous, provide the entire power for the United States. You probably wouldn't want to do that anyway because then that would be kind of like a single point of failure and if the satellite went down, nobody's lights would be on so that would probably make a lot of people unhappy. Yeah. You would definitely not want to just build one of these. You, it would make more, I mean, you would have to decide what the size is that is most appropriate to try to build them. Uh, you could think of like a hydroelectric power dam, right? Like we don't dam every little creek and brook because it just doesn't make sense. We build stuff like the Hoover Dam or the Grand Coulee Dream Dam where it's an enormous thing and it takes a lot of money to build that, but once you've built that, you've essentially got low cost power for the life of the dam, which may be many, many decades. So similar case would be with these solar power satellites where they would have to be pretty large to justify building one and you actually need them to be pretty big for the physics on the microwave beam to work because if the antennas aren't big enough, the beam starts to spread out. Uh, but you definitely wouldn't want to just have one that would be a, your single point of failure. How many of them would you need to make a significant dent in our fossil fuel usage? You would need a lot. I mean, are we looking at 10? Are we looking at 10? Oh, yeah. No, you, I mean, so geosynchronous orbit has a lot of communication satellites in it. And you would want to probably use geosynchronous orbit in almost every case to do this, although a lot of people think that it, other orbits make a lot more sense. Um, the amount of energy that falls, if you took at geosynchronous orbit, if you took a kilometer wide swath, the amount of sunlight that falls on that in one day is more than what we consume in a year. So certainly the capacity there is there uh, if we can put satellites in all that spot to collect it. So, so this is again, you're tapping into your effectively unlimited energy source, the sun, uh, without having to worry about being on the dark side of the planet or being under cloud cover. So, so the capacity is there. Uh, and the question of how many satellites it would take depends on how much, what the capacity of any individual satellite is. Some people say it should be at least one or two gigawatts, five gigawatts, 10 gigawatts. Um, our, the world's consumption is something like 16 terawatts. So these are huge, huge uh, numbers. But there's nothing, like the, the sunlight is there. Uh, the more satellites you have, the more material you have to put in space. If you can get down to the point where the cost of putting things in space is almost what the energy cost is, it becomes very small. But that only happens if you're doing it very frequently. How far away is this from being space-based weaponry? Is this a dual-use technology? Great question, even, great question. Even if it's not intended that way, can it be interpreted that way? Mm -hmm. Then suddenly somebody else wants to weaponize 
Yeah. Satellites. Yeah, no, great question. Uh, the microwave ones would be extraordinarily difficult to weaponize. The laser ones are kind of iffy because uh, with a laser beam, you're going to have a higher power density. And you, the question you should ask yourself is, okay, if the Chinese are going to do this, am I comfortable with them stationing over Hawaii or somewhere a geosynchronous satellite with a five gigawatt laser? And it's not just you, it's whether <laughs> the uh, Department of Defense is comfortable with that, right? So this is people, and there's, trade -off, there's certainly trade-offs. People advocate for laser because they say, oh, you won't have any of the radio interference that you would have with microwave. But now you have this higher power density and this potential political dimension that would be sort of hard to negotiate. The microwave case, it would be very difficult to use a microwave solar power satellite as a weapon. The laser one definitely has a, a closer pathway to that. What about just a giant magnifying glass in the sky? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> didn't, didn't Wile E. Coyote try that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, that, that is certainly a factor. And, and these pros and cons, I, I certainly don't intend to be completely comprehensive. It's kind of the, the major ones that people that's thought. That's a lower level, it sounds like. Yeah, so and in, in focusing on this, the photovoltaic microwave one, weaponization is essentially impossible. So let's go back and look at our barriers, physical, technological, economical. How does uh, solar power satellites compare with these? Physics, no problem. The energy beam, the wireless power, is consistent with uh, Maxwell's equations, the pointing vector, uh, Helmholtz wave equation. We're not creating energy from nothing, no problem. Does the technology exist? There have been a lot of demonstrations of segments of the technology. We have not just the NASA demonstration in the 70s. People have been doing wireless power beaming all over the place for decades. So this is something also that a lot of people just aren't aware of. But wireless power has a very rich history. It's been uh, described by Will Brown, a famous electrical engineer, as ready for use when it's needed. So it's fairly mature technology. There have been cases where even hardware that would go in a solar power satellite has been prototyped uh, on a small scale. And photovoltaics also have been around for a really long time, so that's a very mature technology. So each of the segments that you would need to make a system like this enjoys a lot of maturity. However, it's not been put together into a meaningful end-to-end -end demonstration, so you can't really say that it's been demonstrated. The economics, okay, so all the reports make a big point of talking about the economics. It's tricky because we don't have a demonstration system, we don't really have a, a true data point we can look at and say this is how much it costed. How can we compare it with existing sources and alternatives? There is a quantity called the levelized cost of energy that is commonly used for comparing different sources of energy. It is expressed in cents per kilowatt hour or some unit of uh, cost and some unit of energy. Question becomes, can we construct at least a simplified expression that would give us an idea of what the levelized cost of energy would be for solar power satellites? Factors we might consider, the, the things that go into making the, the dollar part, the, the top part of that, uh, that fraction, the cost of the launch, as we've been discussing, it depends on how many launches you're doing, how much the satellites weigh, cost of the actual satellite design and production, the materials, operation and maintenance, cost of the receiving station, whether there's any government incentives to do something like this. Germany has enjoyed a, a lot more solar power than you would expect because of government incentives. Then the bottom of the fraction, the amount of energy that would be delivered. That depends on how long the satellite's up there. If you put it up there and it's good for five years, it's not very long. If it's good for 50 years, you're getting 10 times as much energy. How big the satellite is, the size of the receiving station, the end-to-end -end efficiency of the system. So if we take just kind of a few of the factors that are likely to have the largest weight, we can put them into an expression that depends only on four things. On the top, on the cost side, the cost of launch, we always have heard that that is going to be a big factor in whether this is feasible or not. The cost of the satellite, and then the hardest to understand perhaps of the quantities is this power per unit mass, and that's just how much power you could expect to get on the ground per kilogram that you have to put in space. You want this number to be huge. If you can get 10,000 watts per kilogram, that would be great. And then the lifetime of the system. How long is it going to be up there? 
So you see that the kilograms cancel out from the top and bottom of this fraction, and you're left with the cents per kilowatt hour, that figure that uh, is a little bit more accessible since we see it each month on our electrical bills. So what I did is I said, all right, let's look at four cases because we don't know necessarily exactly what numbers we should put into this expression. Let's look at what we can do today. If I go out and buy a launch today, how much is it going to cost per, per unit kilogram? If I try to buy a satellite today, what is it likely to cost per unit kilogram? How long do satellites last nowadays? And then uh, there's some recent research that gives us that watts per unit kilogram, and you'll see the, the numbers I've used for that. Now we can assume, okay, what if they're just modest improvements? What if uh, kind of not necessarily Moore's law, but just better than what we have now? Then you can assume more aggressive case, maybe this, the, uh, we really put a focused research effort into something and we get, get more improvements. And then you can say, what if we get revolutionary, nothing that defies laws of physics or something that's without precedent, but very large improvements. So I've tabulated here the results for putting in different values. And you can plug in your own things into this formula. It's a very, very simple formula if you want. And you can see with today's, using today's demonstrated values and this admittedly simplified expression, expression that neglects a lot of factors that you would want to consider when you're doing a, a very uh, detailed, serious analysis of this, you end up at about $16 a kilowatt hour, which is you're not going to pay on your, your Pepco or your uh, Dominion bill. Uh, however, that's not that far off from what DOD is paying in remote places that are difficult to get electricity to. In the case two, the kind of incremental improvements were closer than to the two orders of magnitude out we were with the, uh, the first one. We're still uh, 10 times as much as we'd like to be, but it's not that far out. If we assume this, these aggressive improve improvements, this concentrated effort, you get down to about 7 cents a kilowatt hour. And then if you assume the revolutionary ones, you're too cheap to meter almost, right? With what they used to say about the nuclear energy, the nuclear industry. Let me go into a little bit more depth just about the numbers in cases one and four so that you get a sense that I didn't just pull these out of the air. The service life in years, 20 years, so it is routine in the communication satellite industry for satellites to last 15 to 25 years. There have been satellites that have lasted in excess of 30 years. So uh, in case one where I say 20, uh, it sounds like a long time, but it's actually reasonably conservative. And 35 is not insane. That is, that is something that we've seen. The cost of launch, if you go to Space Exploration Technologies website today and look at their cost uh, per kilogram for a, a launch, uh, if you get their largest rocket, their Falcon 9, uh, that's about $2,500 per kilogram. This is the one where if you're doing it every day and you say, I'm going to buy a thousand of these, you should be able to get the cost down. If you look at the energy to get into orbit and you just cost that out, it's less than $10 to get to orbit in terms of energy cost. So 100 is 10 times that absolute lower bound. So that's also not insane. But is that that's LEO or GEO? That's to LEO. So you would have to have the in-space transportation as well. And, yeah, and, that, and that's one of the simplica simplifications of the model is to, uh, to get it down to four factors. That's one thing that was, was discarded. So you certainly would have to do that. However, if you use electric propulsion and you got these huge uh, photovoltaics, it's not going to be that difficult to go from LEO to uh, GEO. Question? What are the major factors that affect service life? Just like how much power source the satellite has? Well, so once you're in space and you're working, you have radiation that affects your electronics and you have a finite amount of fuel because right now it is difficult or impossible to refuel your spacecraft. And even in geosynchronous orbit, for the orbits we use nowadays for communication satellites, you have to consume fuel on about a monthly basis, basis for station keeping to uh, compensate for the effects of the sun and the moon. There is an orbit called a geosynchronous uh, Laplace plane orbit, which does not require fuel because it's slightly inclined, and you actually wouldn't need station keeping fuel for that, but it would mean that your microwave beam would have to steer, I think, uh, like plus or minus five degrees or something like that. So uh, that's, that's one thing that uh, technically knowledgeable people ask about. Like, oh, well, what's the station keeping requirements for this? And if you use this particular orbit, it would be essentially nothing. So the cost of the space segment, the kind of rule of thumb nowadays is about $10,000 a kilogram for a, uh, uh, any, any given satellite. The cost per kilogram of your widescreen TV is on the order of $50. So if you're mass producing the elements, uh, double that is not insane. 
the mass specific power is kind of the most interesting case until, and uh, I could try to blow my own, own horn too much here, until some research I did, I don't think there was actually a figure for, or, that came, that had an empirical basis. There had been estimates that it would be between four kilograms, or four watts per kilogram and 40 watts per kilogram. And I actually have, have built hardware that demonstrated it was actually six, six watts per kilogram. So, but that's, that has actually been demonstrated. Looking at the 200, you say, well, what's, what's the basis for that? You can buy today thin film solar panels that are 1,000 watts per kilogram. So that admittedly does not include the DC to microwave conversion that you would need to do. But that's not, again, insane. So even case four, which is revolutionary, these are not <coughs> made up numbers. They, they, have, they have a basis. And then the two and three are kind of in between there. So, I, I bet, so I, my sense is that the cost of launch will be higher because you're going to geo. And the cost of the space will be lower because a lot of what you're doing is just this. It's not. It's not all the guts of a real big, you know, a real important satellite like a comm satellite. It's really solar panels. Yeah. Well, and the way you would build this is you would try to make it as modular as possible, where you could generate most of the components on an assembly line and just churn them out and assemble these pieces in space. Some people say they could be self-assembling. A lot of this, like, definitely gets into things that have not been demonstrated very much, but. Um, but, but none of this is, is uh, taken from, uh, with no basis whatsoever. All right, so I told you uh, a little less than an hour ago that I was going to show you some cost numbers. These are from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. These are their estimates for the levelized cost of energy for plants that would go into service in 2017. So they take a huge survey, look at existing plants, they look at resources and trends, and they try to figure out what the cost to generate the electricity, so this is not what you pay, this is what it costs the power company to make it, uh, what that would be in 2017. So the cheapest thing, probably unsurprising to those of you who follow this stuff, is natural gas. Natural gas, advanced combined cycle, about six and a half, and they also account for inflation here, so that's why that might be, seem a little bit higher uh, in 2017. Everything will probably be more expensive. Then you can see they go in kind of a ascending uh, order of costs with the exception of this group of four uh, cases at the bottom, which are the ones from the previous chart. And pretty much uh, like you would expect, the cases three and, and four are the ones that really start to be uh, price com competitive. Uh, now you'll notice I don't account for things like the operation and maintenance or uh, the transmission, you can also see that those contri contributions are actually quite small compared to the levelized capital costs. So the, um, the one that is of most interest probably is the variable operating and maintenance, which includes the fuel. So in the cases where you have something like a coal plant, that uh, about a third of the cost is due to the, the fuel. So. Uh, Tom Murphy really likes the solar. Solar is not very cost competitive, according to energy information. It's hey, very, sen it's hey. very sensitive to that capacity factor. Definitely true, yeah, and that's... So putting solar and wind in places where there's a lot of wind all the time and there's a lot of... Sun Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Sense. Yeah, and actually that's, that's probably a column I should draw some attention to. So this capacity factor tells you how often that plant is running. So. Uh, so I'm assuming the solar power satellite is running for 90%, which is similar to the nuclear plant at 90. But the, the solar PV and the solar thermal, 25, 20%, and that's because you're not only like for a couple hours during the uh, middle of the day do you get like the full power, right? And uh, that reduces the capacity factor. If you could increase that, you would certainly reduce your uh, levelized cost of energy. All right. About the fuel, so one thing we can do is we can express the cost of the fuel based on a direct energy conversion from the kilowatt hour. So kilowatt hour is an expression of, of energy, much like joules. You can have, uh, in a given quantity of fuel, a uh, fixed amount of energy. If we just assume there's 100%, which again, we can't because it would disobey the second law of thermodynamics, uh, we can make a conversion between the cost of a gallon of gasoline or JP8 to the kilowatt hour cost. And what I've done is I've pointed out where these different solar power satellite cases would be. So the uh, $16 a kilowatt hour uh, case one, 
still more expensive than the uh, $400 a gallon for JP8 that the DOD is paying. Case 2 is definitely closer. Case 3 is competitive. And then our uh, too cheap to meter would be way up the chart there. All right, so where does this leave us? I told you at the beginning that we've got this one match, this fossil fuel that we've got now, that no matter when you think it's going to run out, it will run out. Should we be using part of our match on solar power satellites? How do we do against the three barriers with the solar power satellites? Well, physical, no problem, but then again, everything except for uh, perpetual motion, and uh, Joe Newman does pretty well against physical. Technological, we've said the pieces are there, but they haven't been demonstrated in an end-to-end -end system. The economical, depending on the assumptions you put into the model, you can see there's a huge range between $16 a kilowatt hour and less than a cent a kilowatt hour. So what does this mean? Well, at the risk of sounding uh, like a stereotypical researcher, to definitively address the technological and economical barriers, more research is required. <laughs> so, but, but it is true. I want to put this in perspective relative to one prominent alternative that you're familiar with and that I've already mentioned once in this presentation, and that is fusion. So you may know that there is a joke in the fusion community, and uh, I guess people who follow fusion, and that is that fusion has been 10 years away for about 60 years. <laughs> How much have we spent on fusion in the last 60 years? We've spent about $30 billion in inflation-adjusted uh, inflation dollars on fusion between 1953 in 2012, and in 2012 we spent 700 million, not quite a billion dollars, but certainly a sizable, sizable amount of money. In that same period, we spent less than one one thousandth of that amount on solar power satellites. Now I'll remind you, for fusion, nobody is trying to build a fusion power plant right now. If you look at ITER and Europe and any of the research we've done, National Ignition Facility, these are all experimental, so nobody is at the point where they're trying to build an operational fusion power plant. They are still doing research. You could say, if we are going to be serious about this all of the above energy strategy that you've heard, where we use things that are kind of known quantities, but we're also pursuing these high risk, high payoff situations like fusion, probably makes more sense to do additional research into space solar power. Now, I'm not saying we should develop space solar power. I'm saying that the research should be done to clarify exactly how realistic of a source it is, since it does seem like there's a range in some places where it would work and some places where it certainly would not work. Once that match that I've been describing is gone, it may be too late. Thank you for listening. I'm just curious because you kept referring to the cost of getting energy to remote military uh, operations. So would this uh, space power, would, would the microwave receivers be fairly mobile and something where the, the satellite could change its aim fairly quickly? Yeah, so the, the rectenna receiver is amazingly simple. It's essentially, there's a lot of ways you could do it, but it's essentially like a wire and a Schottky diode. And you would still have to have like a, a collection network, but uh, it's incredibly robust. It's not very heavy. It can be packed up quite small. Now, one thing that I should mention about the military case is that they need more than just energy at a military base. You can have all the energy you want, but if you don't have food, you don't have water, you don't have ammo, you're not really a military base. And you can't send those things in with a microwave beam. <laughs> so the, not yet, right yet. <laughs> So, uh, so I think it's important, I, I've talked a lot about the military case, but I don't want to, to uh, give you any illusions. Uh, there's probably not a really awesome way to like, completely get rid of logistical deliveries to military bases. So uh, a lot of people have kind of, especially advocates of solar power satellites, have seized onto this military case and say, oh, DOD has lots of money, they pay inflated prices for everything, they can develop solar power satellites. But it doesn't actually solve all of the problems. Like you could reduce the the amount of fuel you have to deliver, but uh, you're not going to like. This is not a magical solution to uh, supplying military bases. If that's the case, then uh, like one of the things, one of the factors you had was it for backyards. Like, could you have like your own personal receiver, or is that probably not? Okay. The the reason for that is with the the 
way the microwave beam works. So, um, so you know, light and microwaves are, are all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The only difference is the wavelength, well, I guess the, ener the energy in it. Uh, if you use these microwave wavelengths, the two and a half gigahertz, that give you the advantage of being able to get to the atmosphere and the cloud and the rain, you have to have a large transmitter. And when I say large, I'm for, at, uh, say, uh, 5.8 gigahertz, twice the frequency, you need a kilometer diameter transmitting antenna in space and probably a five kilometer receiving station, which also is not gonna fit very well on your combat outpost. Um, so putting something in your backyard either is not gonna work very well or you're going to have to worry again about this energy density problem where maybe you can get this like millimeter wave, wave beam that you can direct to people's houses, but there's gonna be a lot of energy in that beam. Can I follow up on that? Uh, Please. Uh, so if you're talking about a five kilometer you know, diameter or radius, uh, <coughs> that much area, how, like what kind of urban density would that necessarily, how much energy would that be? So the footprint of the beam and the energy in the beam are actually independent to a large extent. You have to have, even if you're just trying to get down 10 watts for at the frequency at the 5.8 gigahertz to get, to, to close that link, to have that link not be in the noise, to get the 90% the kind of beam coupling that you would probably want for this sort of system, um, you need that size. Now once you have that, you could put the five or 10 gigawatts through there, and what would happen is the energy density in the center of the beam would be a lot higher at the risk of getting a little technical here. So the, the transmit uh, energy profile on the antenna in space would be approximately a Gaussian distribution. Okay. And the reason for that is just because it avoids the side lobes, so you're not like sending energy off into places that you don't want. And uh, kind of commensurately, the energy density in the center of the receiving station would be the highest. Uh, but what level that is, is is contingent on how much total energy you're trying to get down. One thing that people also typically ask about is, so how do we know this energy beam isn't go wandering around the uh, countryside? And that's actually effectively been solved, or it's been demonstrated, I should say. Uh, if you have a pilot beam, as you certainly would want to, in the center of your receiver, that sends a signal up to the satellite, and it uses the phase from that pilot signal to direct the beam. So unless the satellite is receiving that pilot signal, it's not gonna send the energy, it would totally disperse. And this has been demonstrated a, a number of occasions. There's a, a colleague of mine, uh, Nobukaya from the uh, University of Kobe in Japan, who has uh, demonstrated this with like a little microwave powered rover and he has a phased array and the rover sends out a pilot signal and as it drives around, the microwave beam just follows it around and if you turn it off, the energy spreads out. So that's a problem that people are often worried about that ha has actually already been addressed. I wanted to explore potential problems. Uh as you said, there's no clouds in space, but there is space weather. Certainly. And, um, uh, thinking of the worst case scenario, I guess it was sometime in the mid-19th century, there was a devastating yep, yep. Uh, event, uh, or even something from about 25 years ago, a Quebec power grid went off. Of course, being exposed in geosynchronous orbit, the spacecraft yep. would be scorched. Yeah, no, and that is that is definitely a concern. Uh, one thing that is less of a concern, I'll just mention it because it's kind of in a similar vein, is people are worried a lot about space debris, but space debris is primarily a problem in low Earth orbit, not in geosynchronous orbit. Dealing with the, the possibility of a solar storm is, is a very real consideration. Uh, I don't think people know exactly what the magnitude of such things could be. Like the 19th century case you talked about seems like it's probably worse than anything we've seen since. Uh, and when you design communications and other satellites now, you put in measures to try to deal, depending on what your mission length requirements are, to make yourself resilient to solar activity. And sometimes people will safe the satellites if they know there's a solar storm coming. Uh, and that might be something you would have to do, where you would have to take it offline and like position it in a particular way that would make it more likely to survive. Or you would have to design it to be robust. And that's, I think that's part of the research that I'm advocating should be done. Any other questions? Oh. Yeah, I, I generally like the idea. Um, I guess I'm a little concerned about that one chart that had the uh, cost of the alternative uh, versus what you have. Being, being a uh, okay. double E major, as you were, you're familiar with the fact that hard drives were supposed to disappear about 30 years ago. 
and they just kept making them better and better and better, and it was pretty difficult for the chip memories until maybe last year to actually compete with them. So yep. I'm wondering if that's not potentially an issue with what you're talking about, particularly if you become competitive with the current sources of energy. Yeah, no, no, certainly that is a, an issue. Like, uh, I mean, so this also brings in, you may have read The Innovator's Dilemma and be familiar with Moore's Law and how, how things get better and better. Like, you could get to a case where maybe we get really good at, like, the ground storage of the electricity and having the slow, um, the, if you only have uh, sunlight for a couple hours a day and you can build it up and you can store up, like, a month's worth of electricity, if you could do that cheaply, like, the case for doing something like this certainly is lessened because uh, you're addressing one of the main shortcomings of the alternatives. So yeah, I mean, I mean, this is definitely, that is something you have to weigh in. Uh, the fact is that for large scale energy, like it has to be able at some point to be able to compete on cost, except for in these like weird situations like the military or if you have a remote research station or an island or something. So, so yeah, you would have to be able to get there eventually. And I agree that it's not clear whether that path exists or not. It may or it may not. Does the uh, levelized cost of energy account for any kind of externality, like pollution? Um, it depends on which formulation you use. So some of the levelized costs of energy expressions have like 20 different terms in them. And researchers kind of make up their own. Uh, I don't know exactly what they did, what the Energy Information Agency uh, did for each of those cases. Uh, so, but certainly you, if you applied some uh, cost factor, like if you say like, oh, for whatever amount of tons of carbon you emit, you should increase the cost by X amount. So I don't know if that's done. You certainly could include that. I only, you saw in the solar power satellite when I only have four terms, so that's clearly not included in that. All right, thank you very much. Please join us next door for